of the imputations. Uh, we're going to continue with this lesson, and this is called the pre bema seat self-examination. <laughs> Better, according to Scripture, if we examine ourselves first before we're examined. Uh, people train when, before they go on a jeopardy. They take training to get before they even turn in their um, uh, auditions to see if they'll get called up for an audition to see if if they pass uh, the test of getting to the television show where they can win money, of course. And it's pretty grueling uh, thing. It's not just all fun and games and, you know, shooting from the hip uh, or the lip. Uh, they have to be pretty versed, pretty well versed in a lot of fields. And uh, I can get a few of them, but I'd get killed in most of them, especially when they got into Shakespeare. I uh, didn't get into much of that or some of the other subjects. But um, pre beam seat examination, self-examination, you know, we check ourselves out uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we are uh, living the way the Lord wants us to live. And um, we examine ourselves. Uh, as Christians on a regular basis. Paul said he was uh, doing that all the time, checking with himself to make sure that uh, he's keeping in line with the things that God wants him to do and to be. Um, James chapter 1 and verse 25, I'm going to jump off from this. This is a type of study where we are looking at saying things that uh, relate to things that God is going to give us as a part of our eternal rewards. And at the beam of seat of Christ is not the time to be this all becoming new to you. It should not be new to us. It should be something that uh, we are, have uh, our heads up. When we go to heaven, we go with what edification complex that we have. We go with what knowledge that we have. Uh, and it's not like he dumps all that knowledge in us when he, we get there. We'll have all eternity to learn and to learn it exactly right, the things that are relevant uh, to the plan of God for us going forward at that time. But we can know, and it's good for our minds to live in that world for the most part because the world will have us to live in its mindset. The world will have us to live in its its echo chamber. It, the world will have us to live with a human point of view. Uh, and uh, with that, we can be manipulated, uh, molded in its image. And, uh, well, that does just won't fly at that time. And so there's a lot of deprogramming that takes place when it comes to edif being edified in Christ. And that deprogramming part is, is difficult. You, you see the problem that the apostles had with the Judaizers and the scribes and the Pharisees uh, and the Jewish people as a whole uh, when it came to changing from one dispensation to the next. Uh, they weren't ready to be deprogrammed. James wasn't ready. He's the Lord's half-brother, Mary's child. He wasn't ready. Jude wasn't quite ready. None of them were really that ready. And so growing is, uh, it, you know, we think about the unsaved. The Bible says that Jesus is a stone of stumbling, a, a, a rock of offense to the Jew and to many Gentiles as well. But as his word comes to us, uh, we can find out that it also can be a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling for Christians too uh, when it comes to his commandments and his word. And so we understand uh, that we have a living Savior that uh, is always honest and honorable with us. In James 1.25 it says, But whosoever looks into the Perfect law of liberty. Another word there is for freedom, spiritual freedom. That's, that is a full flow of truth in the spirit that is recalled to the thoughts and the emotions, of course, and to the conscience and to the self-awareness and to the will. That spirit of God sends that back into our thinking once it's become something that we have absorbed and accepted not just academically but in our spirit whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it that's in it's in italics but it is readable and continues in that frame of mind 
not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this person, this man, shall be blessed. Future active indicative, which means no element of doubt. Is the word therefore blessed, shall be blessed, is actually, actually seen as one word, which means you will be blessed in your deed. Now that's in, maybe not in time to the full, actually never in time to the fullest extent that we, it will be when we get to heaven. This is just not hardly the tip of the iceberg what we see when the blessings come. As you know, most of the iceberg is out of sight. It's under the water. Well, most of our blessings are if you would turn an iceberg upside down and you'd see in our life the tip and then you, all that mass that is associated with those blessings is in the heavens. It's safer up there where rust and moth do not corrupt. And so that is a wonderful thing. So we may, we will never know in time the brevity of our choices and our decisions until we get to heaven. So we can always take stock when the Bible says it's important that it's important, very important. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we go into this lesson of self-examination, prior to the Bema Seat, we realize that it could start tomorrow. And it's a solemn thought that if the rapture of the church should happen tonight, in a very soon time, the judgment of our life will start as well. And let us be cognizant of that, not afraid, but thankful for that, that we are on the winning team. And not only that, but we can show honor to the Lord uh, in this life that we have here on earth until that day comes. And then we can honor him for all eternity where there is no more corruption and no more falling back and everything else that we might do in our, our old life, our life here. So we pray, Father, that you will strengthen us and help us in the faith. We know that that's what you want, that's what you intend to do, and that's what your word offers. We thank you now for... All those who could make it out tonight, we ask your blessings in the Word and that it will become foundational to our instincts and that it will be something that will be uh, shared and blessed within our lives, with our family, with the people that we come in contact with, but more importantly, that it will be seen by you as honorable, that powers and principalities will be put on notice, that you we mean business for the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again for this privilege in this short period called human life. In Jesus' name, amen. pre bema seat self-examination. Well, one thing that uh, we've said here for many, many years uh, is that we must make the adjustments uh, to the standard of God when we are confronted with those standards and our proper adjustment to the justice of God while we are here in time uh, well that justice or that righteous standard of God steers us to comply with God's righteousness well that's critical to our success at the judgment seat of Christ sentimentalism just because we meant well does not make the grade if the answer is wrong you do not get an A you do not get a trophy for showing up as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, we afford God the opportunity to mature us spiritually. And this growth process involves our individual responsibility of thinking through the doctrines that we are taught. Most of that is not being done in the class. That will be after class. That's like that's always been my homework to go over my notes and to chew on something. And if I have something that I got in my notes that I'm not aware of, then I would ask the pastor. And I did that for 27 years. I've got notebooks, and some of you others have notebooks upon notebooks too. And I would ask. I'd chew on it and chew on it, not to, to, to find resistance to it, but to find clarification. Now, if I thought it was just dead wrong, I would announce that, but not in the middle of the service. I would Not that stupid. You know, our pastor was a wonderful man, but he was also ex-Marine. And as he would say, once a Marine, always a Marine. And uh, he was also a reconnaissance Marine. He was also a military policeman while he was in. So, you know, I didn't mess with him when it comes to, 
you know, he always said that I would do my, he would do his homework. He said, you can be sure if you call me and you want to call me on the carpet about something, or if you want to use that terminology, just be sure that I have done my homework. And I, I know I've seen his books. And I've seen him sit there and underline every line as he was going through it in pars and uh, conjugate as he would go along through the language. And I would, I would appreciate that. I think. <laughs> but I learned. And it wasn't intimidating. It was educational. Okay? So it helped me to learn. It helps us to learn. That we have growth and that we learn, but we learn a lot after class. That growth process involves, as we learn the things of God, to adjust to the standards of God. And as our former pastor used to say, if we do not adjust, now this is not to, between you and me, but when it comes to us and God, if we do not adjust to the justice of God, the justice of God will adjust to us. That's the way the plan of God works because He's trying to steer us in the straight we're on the straight and narrow, but he tries to steer us to keep us on the straight and narrow. The Word of God does. And we need that because we have the propensity with our instincts to sway and to stray away. We all do. All of us do. Whether it's in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, whether it's through the, the gutter or through self-righteousness, we all have the propensity to, to, to have that weak link somewhere in us. But if I do not believe that the justice of God will adjust to me if I decide to walk on my own, then I am in trouble. And God will show me that He is not asleep. The spiritual growth process involves us understanding God's Word. See, God is growing adults. God does not, is not pleased with believers who stay in perpetual infancy. God is not pleased with the believer who stays in perpetual grade school type thinking. He's not pleased with that because he has so much that he has to withhold from us for his glory if we don't participate in growing. The spiritual growth process involves understanding God's word through the human spirit, not merely as an academic exercise, a brainiac or whatever, but that there is a real connection that is established between our soul and the Lord. A real connection. God is real. Jesus Christ is real. And it doesn't have to be emotional for us to sense that. Spiritual knowledge and the leadership of the Holy Spirit are our daily link to God. Not activity. Not emotions. Not sweet Sugary songs that Christianity has kind of morphed into this blob of something. I don't know what it is. It's just like a wad of Cairo syrup or something. I don't know. And it's not at all biblical at all. There's no doctrinal content. And often it is apostate in, obviously apostate in tone and tenor, but also often apostate in intention and doctrine, false doctrine. Oh, I have heard songs that were on a playlist uh, on Spotify dealing with the Holy Spirit that was almost, and I hate to use this term, but it was almost erotica type music. And the terminology was as well. And I felt dirty listening to it. And it was a song of a person's love for the Holy Spirit. And it was sickening. And that's not uncommon. Well, that is blasphemy. And they don't see it that way. And so you have to watch little ears what you listen to. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As you think in your heart, so are you. Thus what we think on is what we are in character. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 tells us the word of God is the mind of Christ. And Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when the mind of Christ, which is the word of God, becomes the motivation to our thinking and the motivator to our actions, then that thinking is mixed with our free will and the providence of God. Then our outward living honors God. 
As we think properly, we respond to the Holy Spirit's leadership in our works as well. So if Jesus Christ is important to us, then what he thinks has to be important to us. Obviously, none of us, as we sum up our life, stand before the Lord, none of us will have honored the Lord as we should all the days of our life as Christians. I don't think so. At least I'll have to say I have not always honored the Lord the best that I could as a Christian. Not all the days of my life. We all may have gone our own way at times when we have allowed our free will to serve the old sin nature in some form or fashion. Again, this is a self-examination. This is not a judgment. This is a self-examination. Are there times that that has been a part of my life? The big question will be, though, in the end, what has summarized your practice in life? I ask that to myself. What has summarized the body of work or the body of life that I have lived as a Christian? What has predominated my life or your life as a Christian? I don't ask you about yours. You ask yourself, I ask myself. This is to thine own self be true. James 1.25 says, But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, the word looketh is an aorist active participle. That's a participle there. That's an adjectival verb. Whosoever looks, and the aorist tense means as a body, as a whole, whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, that is, the freedom that you had in grace to live as God would have you to live and continues in it as a body of work in their life, as a habit of their life. Whoever continues to live in it and continues in it, that's an aorist middle participle, which means you participated in it as a whole of life, aorist tense again, the train station, point A to point B. You being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that's a noun there, word uh, doer is, is poietes, or a practicer of ergonomics, or spiritual ergonomics, or work, this one shall be blessed. We had this to say that we're perfect in our living all of the time, though that's what we should all strive for and by submitting to the Lord and His Word. But we have made it a, a point to do that. We have made it a point to live for the Lord. When we get down on ourselves, we made it a point to get back. When we go through little bouts of depression, we made it a point to get out of the funk. When we've messed up, we made it a point not to be proud, but to use 1 John 1, 9 and get back in the saddle. See, freedom and grace doesn't mean we can live the way, any way we want. That's not freedom. That's bondage to sin. Freedom and grace means the believer is free to abound in the blessings of God without worry, guilt, or sin, or guilt, self-guilt. So I want to say this, that the successful believer at the judgment seat of Christ, i got three things here, has honored the Lord as a habit of life. I'm, I may have that in your notes. I'm not sure. But the successful believer at the judgment seat of Christ has honored the Lord as a habit of life. That is the life since you've gotten saved. Again, I didn't say that we were perfect every day. We are in position, but not always in practice. We know. But we don't use that as a cop-out or an excuse either. We're always being driven to be better uh, as Christians. Not in works per se, but in character. The works will come. Or the works are being done. Often we spend so much time on the works that we do, we forget that God is doing a work on us. <laughs> But the successful believer, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, some of the things that will be uh, supreme is, did we honor the Lord as a habit of life? That's a big one. We talked about that Sunday. And then secondly, has uh, as a su successful believer at the judgment seat of Christ, 
have we practiced a lifestyle of, or have we uh, practiced a lifestyle of giving in to the dictates of the old sin nature that we just basically just crumble every time the old sin nature uh, came a call and we we said hello, what can I do for you? <laughs> you know, if there's a door that has a tendency to be swung a lot, it it it. It has a tendency to open a lot easier. It's just like something that's new, and it's kind of stiff, you know. And then, uh, but if it gets used a lot, it becomes pretty, pretty loose and gets worn out. And I think sometimes the hinges in our life get to where, uh, or the sockets in our life get to where there's certain things that give out quicker than others. But in our spiritual life, the old sin nature is always trying to f- dig and find something that gets to us and it knows our weak link so has that been the practice of our life and then thirdly the successful believer at the judgment seat of christ is a a believer that has not participated in the resistance movement of the cosmic system and i call it a resistance movement it is an antagonistic movement that resist the word of God and the authority of God over the believer's life. The old sin nature works in concert with the world, the flesh, and the devil as a resistance movement against God's plan being produced in our lives. It is a resistance to the communique of the word of God. It is a resistance to the official doctrinal standard teaching and preaching of the word of God. There are a lot of believers who love a lot of things, but they do not have a great love for the Word of God. And they don't grow. The cosmic system has a nasty disposition toward the Word of God. And the old sin nature has a nasty disposition toward the Word of God. And that's why I have had people tell me, and even in my study, that doctrine doesn't work. I just can't, I can't raise my children according to the Bible. I, I can't be the kind of wife that the Bible calls on me to be. I can't be the kind of husband that the Bible calls on to me. I can't be the kind of giver that the Bible calls on to me. I can't do this or I can't do that. Well, that's the old sin nature. That's the human and bringing its influence of self-justification upon the will. And the more we say I can't, the more we won't. And it can become a standard. People who are people of excellence in the plan of God or in in the world are people who don't say can't very often. They they are they are true to themselves. That cosmic system, that satanic system that deposes opposes God for the purpose of deposing God, is a system that lowers the honor of God and exalts the freeness or the feebleness of people in both the believer and the unbeliever. It exalts the feebleness of our wisdom above that of the Word of God. If I will be a successful believer at the judgment seat of Christ, that's not the kind of life I've lived. If you have been overall, though, positive to the Word of the Lord, then you are in good shape. But if you've been negative, if you've been ambivalent, if I've been ambivalent, didn't care one way or another toward the word of the Lord, I'm going to be in trouble at the beam of seat of Christ. Not for loss of salvation. And I don't, I don't know. I, some of you have been in the military and some of you know what it's like. And some of you have just been in a home and had your mother lock your heels. You know what that means. And they call out your whole name. You know you're in trouble when you're little. <laughs> oh my word. And they call out that whole name. You know, that means all of you is in trouble, including the gluteus maximus, perhaps. You better get in here. You better get in here now. There better not be any whining. There better not be any dragging along. You better get in there. And a few times of that, and, uh, well, you learn to straighten up and fly right. You do whatever mama wants. Daddy too. When he, he, that's the way it was. That's the way it should be. I mean, you are the adult in the house. And people tell me that doesn't work is that they, and I'm talking about Christians, they have flaked out on the plan of God. How far along in the Christian life has your positive will toward God carried you? Well, you're here tonight. I'm here tonight. 
It's helped you through a lot of circumstances. It helps you when the difficult times come. It helps you when the temptation comes. It helps you when in your old nature, you know, you get all, you know, bent out of shape. We all do from time to time. Help us to cool our jets, you know. That's that's good. You ask yourself, did you give up when you had tough decisions to make regarding living an honorable life unto the Lord, or did you just give in to the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life? Did you just give in? Well, you don't want that to be your testimony. I don't want that to be mine. Were you willing to, uh, willing, or have you had to forsake others to follow Christ? These are questions, pre seat questions to ask yourselves, as I have to ask them myself. Have I been willing to forsake others to follow Christ? Doesn't mean you have to, but have you ever been put in a position where, you know, you had to do the right thing and God had to come first? He keeps a score of that. But He also has a score of when you said, heck with that, I'm going with her. I'm going with Him. I'm going to do what they want. I'm going to do what my friends want. I'm going to do what my culture and my community wants. I'm going to do what my whatever wants. Have you cracked the spiritual maturity barrier? Have I cracked the spiritual maturity barrier? doesn't mean that now I've cracked the spiritual maturity barrier, that you know now I can live on easy street. It means now the Lord's going to require more of me. When you go through... Uh, some of here you here understand this. When you go through undergraduate work, you know they coach you along, not a whole lot, but they coach you along. But and they charge a base rate for the most part for your classes, whether it's quarters or semesters or whatever. But when you go into a, a postgraduate program, it's going to charge you a whole lot more, and they're going to drill you and drill you and drill you, and see whether or not. Uh, uh, you're sustainable in that professional, whatever it might be, that you'll be able to handle the maturity because there's not going to be anybody behind you. When you leave and go out there in public, there's not going to be anybody to back you up. You signed off on it. You own it. And you have the liability that goes with it. I'm bonded. And I have a liability that goes with what I do when I do a wedding. Now, I don't have to be bonded to do a funeral, <laughs> but you have to be bonded to do a wedding. But when you do counseling, you have to be licensed. and Or whatever you must do, you try to do it to the best of your ability. You're trying to help people out. But for Christians in general, and that includes myself and all of us here, have I cracked or have you cracked a maturity barrier? And I'll say, well, here's five things to let you know if you have. Are you grace-oriented? Because you are, if you've chosen to obey the Lord, and you know your place as a servant of God. We all are servants of God. We're not servants of the church or the preacher. We're servants of God. They just happen to be part of that sometimes. Are you grace-oriented? You've chosen to obey the Lord, and you know your place as a servant of God. You don't put yourself first. I don't put myself first. I put God first. And through the word, I'll learn what that looks like. You're learning the basics, though, and then you're moving forward and learning more. Secondly, a sign that you're cracking or have cracked a maturity barrier, you have the mastery of the details of life. In other words, God's your number one priority. Not people. God is the one you please, not people. That is, people who try to get you to turn from God and your, your, what God tells you how you're supposed to live. Uh, circumstances aren't your number one priority because they always can vary. Possessions aren't our number one priority. We put God first. First John 2, 15 through 17, John says that the things that are of the world They're not of the Father, and they pass away. You have not allowed your circumstances to dictate whether or not you're going to be faithful to the Lord. All these are pre-Bema seat self-examination questions that I ask myself. Have I allowed my circumstances to dictate whether or not 
faithfulness to the Lord is important. The details of life, which we all have, job, family, living in our life and our world, the details of life and your interaction with people has not distracted you from faithfully absorbing on the command of the Lord His Word. And some believers, they get distracted from faithfully absorbing the Word. And they do it regularly. They're regularly distracted. That's a problem. It's like missing class all the time means that there's lessons that will not make sense down the road. And God does that because He has a program. (laughs) God has the program of structure for learning. And we have the sides that we learn as well, but we stay with that as too. Just like when you're going through a course in college or trade school, you have to continue to take the course to keep up with the course, but you still have your own study, the own, the, your own things that you do, and they enhance what you're doing, but you stay, still stay with the course. And then number three, you cracked a spiritual maturity barrier, but if you have gotten to the point where you have a relaxed mental attitude of agape or unconditional love toward people. Because when you have an unconditional love toward people, mental attitude sins don't wreck your thought life. A relaxed mental attitude. And these, these are, these are, these are phases of growth. We understand God is the potter and we are the clay. We understand he squeezes when he wants to, where he wants to, the way he wants to. We understand that. And we understand that we're being molded into the character of Christ. So we need to put God first. So we, 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 we don't let the details of life master us because we only have one master. That's Christ. And as that happens, as we're learning, as we're growing, we start becoming more at ease. With life, we realize that God is the one that everyone ultimately answers to. So we don't get all bent out of shape because unsaved people are living like pigs or self-righteously judgmental. And we don't want to be that way, for sure. We better not be. But when you have a relaxed mental attitude of unconditional or agape love, mental attitude sins don't cloud your judgment. And they don't spoil your witness for the Lord. The fourth level, showing that you cracked a spiritual maturity barrier, is that you have such unconditional love, so much so that the character of Christ shines through with everyone you meet. And this love puts others ahead of you. You're sacrificial now. It doesn't kill you to be sacrificial doesn't kill you to be sacrificial. I don't mind my time to do this. I don't mind helping out. I don't mind doing this. You know, it doesn't make you feel like it's a burden to to help others. That's what Jesus was always in love. And another heard a person say the other day, and a good term that they used for agape love is that it's sacrificial love. You don't expect something in return for it. Though you may get a thank you or pat on the back or whatever, but you, you don't do it only because you get something for it. You, you sense that God is pleased with you with that, and He is. Also, if you have that fourth a level of maturity where virtue love shines through you, and this is because sinful thoughts aren't invading your thought life, then you're not touchy, you're not easily offended. Does not keep you do not keep scoring those. I'm going into First Corinthians 13 verses five through seven, I think, right now. But just as a verse, there you might stick down there. First Corinthians 13, I think, five through seven. But if you have that type of love, uh, you don't keep up keep a score on other people. Uh, you don't hold grudges on other people, and you're not boastful because Christ is number one in your life. And you do not seek nor receive satisfaction when you see other people flub up, mess up, and get hurt. And you're not selfish. And then the fifth thing, which is the last thing I wanted to cover on this, showing that you have cracked a spiritual maturity barrier, is that you enter into a realm of of happiness 
you share in the happiness of God. And as a habit of life, you exude a spiritual nobility befitting the son or daughter of a king. You share in the happiness of God and you exude a spiritual nobility that is befitting of the son or a daughter of a king. I don't know if I had those in the notes or not. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. good. <laughs> they were important. Sometimes I don't remember what I leave out and erase out whatever I put in. Or sometimes I'll rewrite the notes just a little bit, so I might come off a little bit different sometimes. But sharing in the happiness of God, you have a contentment. Like Paul said in Philippians 4, I've found whatsoever state I am there with to be content, whether I have a little or much. Doesn't mean that he didn't get hot about stuff when he got mistreated at times because he did. Jesus got hot about stuff and righteously so when he was mistreated from time to time. And other times he just swallowed it and says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God will take care of it. But his love helped him to see past, you know, his sense of, of uh, getting revenge or something like that. But you share in the happiness of God and you exude a spiritual nobility. You are and I am as a believer in the royal family of God. So it means we shouldn't act trashy, shouldn't either put on airs. You know what I'm saying. But since all of these questions are important now, I think they will be important at that day because he judges us based on the condition of our heart more than the portfolio of our works, the condition of our heart. And that really takes a lot of humility, not a lot of ingenuity, but it takes a lot of humility, and I think you all know that. There's a day we'll stand and give account to Him, so I believe that these things are important now. None of us will have an acceptable excuse I think for not reaching spiritual maturity. These five things are just examples. They are benchmarks, as you want to call them that. I would call them benchmarks that describe for us. And I think we need to know how we're doing. You get a report card when you're a child. What is that? Every six weeks they give them a little report card or something, or they send them to the parents, and then they, I don't know how it works going forward, but we used to take, you know, in college you take exams and everything else. You get past that and you've got to write a paper, a thesis or whatever as you go in postgraduate programs and different things. Or some have to do a certain work thing they have to do under supervision. That's part of it, or like an internship perhaps. But none of us will have an acceptable excuse as believers for not reaching maturity. That is, unless you just got saved before the rapture or whatever. None of us will have an excuse for not being decorated for valiant service on the day because we all have the same grace assets needed to be honorable for God. We all have the exact same programming inside of us. We all have different experience. We all all have the same God with the same omnipotent power and the same divine assets within us to be wonderful in in our Christian life. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the grace assets. We have, that's not a liability. That's the grace aspect, asset. Now we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is God Himself lives in us. We have the uh, quickened human spirit, which now we can ping. We can connect. There's no excuse for us not knowing because we can all ping if we will agree with the truth. A lot of believers don't agree with the truth, so there's not any fellowship between them and God, and God knows it. That's sad because it'll be not a good day for them on that day. Loss of rewards if they're truly saved. But we also have the Word of God. That's a wonderful thing to have. It gives us, it's like a light and a guide and salt to preserve us and gives us guidance that we need and wisdom that we need. Tells us when we're behaving and we're misbehaving. If we don't know it, it's written there. (laughs) And thank goodness, you know, we have a free will to choose to say yes to God or and no to the sinful propensities that we might have. We all have that. We have the choice to be made. 
And I think that for us in America, there's a lot to be required of a believer in America versus a believer that's in some remote place that perhaps may not even have a Bible in their language. Their heart will be judged and extrapolation for what they could do were they to know that's only by the omniscience of God knowing that. So there'd be some believers who didn't have a Bible or didn't have much, but they were a spirit led believer that did what as much as they knew how to do the best they could. And um, whereas some of the doctrine and the teaching that they don't have, uh, the Spirit of God has become a greater comforter than the knowledge of God because they didn't have the truth in such a way as we do with all the scriptures that we have. And there are those that are working all the time trying to, you know, fix that. But there is a stringent vetting done by the Lord at the Bema seat. A stringent vetting. You can't, I can't win him over with, you know, uh, how to win friends and influence people, the Dale Carnegie course or whatever. That won't help us at the Bema seat of Christ. Or you've got a great emotional, uh, effervescent personality and the other person is quiet as a mouse. You know, either one don't help. It's the character of our heart. Be who you are. Don't try to be somebody you're not. If I tried to be, you know, uh, one type of person that I'm not, or you tried to be somebody that you're not, it's not going to make us any more spiritual. It, it's not. Just be in fellowship with the Lord and keep growing in the Word. But there will be a stringent vetting done by the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, in Second Corinthians chapter five and verse ten, a very familiar passage, you know, that all of our works will be done, whether they were good or bad. We've all got to appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it's good or bad. First Corinthians uh, three one uh, uh, twelve through uh, fifteen or whatever there that passage, the Lord will judge us for reward. So the vetting will be stringent. Not everyone gets a trophy. Not everyone gets a trophy. Just as a, you know, just an example. And the trophy represents what you thought of Christ while you were here on earth. There is no, God is no respecter of person, so he doesn't, treat one better than he does the other. He doesn't treat one race better than the other. He does not treat one, a man or a woman differently than he does the other at the Bema Seat of Christ. The question for the wife at the Judgment Seat of Christ will not be, how good of a husband did you lead in your home? It won't be. And men, you know, how far did you jump through the ceiling when your wife screamed at you? You won't get a trophy for that. Because that's not what a man does. A man is not mean. He's loving to his wife. And a wife is not a, well, I'm not going to say it. Because she is subject to Christ. And she has a set of rules to follow. And so does the man. And so do the children have a set of rules to follow. And if I'm a child and I get saved. And I'm still under my parents. And the rapture happens. I better hope that I was an obedient child at the Bema Seat of Christ. Because I don't care how many prayer meetings. I don't care how many youth camps I went to. If I was a jerk, it will show up at the Bema Seat of Christ. So, you know... The rules are the rules are the rules. And God knows how to flush those out according to the the will and the abilities of the individuals. We, We get that. And I did would not want to be the pastor that got steamrolled by his congregation because they got tired of the word and then expected to get the pastor's crown because there is a crown for pastors only. But the pastor's crown, which we'll get to, believers can earn stars in their crowns based on the past. They're, they're helping their, if it's a good pastor to helping. There's things that they can get in their crown. They may not get the crown, but they may get some of those remunerations in addition to their works and the way they live their Christian life for the Lord. That's important to Christ. That's a big deal to Christ. We, 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 we dismiss it 
but only because of arrogance, because pastors are called under shepherds. And if you're the chief shepherd, then the under shepherds, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, that they are like the candlesticks that he holds up in his hand. Isaiah said, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and everything, every tongue that rises up against thee shall be brought down in judgment. And that was a, that was an indictment against those who, who ridiculed the prophets. So I'm just throwing that out there free of charge for more trophies so that we can get more trophies. Yeah, it sounds selfish, but it really, God wants things to work together, of course, according to the rule and according to truth. But there's no reason we should not get the well done on that day. We all have equal opportunity to be outstanding ambassadors for Jesus Christ, to be a good witness for Christ, both publicly and privately. Now, you uh, you may say, how am I an ambassador for Christ on the private level? I thought that was just the public level. Well, the answer is you are being observed by powers and principalities right this moment. Hello? What? Oh, yeah. You're being observed by powers and principalities. The Bible says that the angels stoop down to hear the word of God. And I think it's... uh, it's either first or second Peter. I have to go back to it. But yeah, the angels bend down to hear the word of God. And I will guarantee you that the fallen angels are bending down too to distort the word of God. Did you ever hear the wings fluttering in the rafters on Sunday morning out there? I guess they don't think. We have a low ceiling in here. Or tiny angels come in here, I guess. But we are being observed, observed by powers and principalities, and we are, we're, in, we're in a warfare all the time, and we are observed. So uh, we are not just ambassadors to the uh, human beings, but we also ambassadors to the angels as well as we live out the life. That, and remember, Job, you know what he went through. So there may be lesser cases than Job's. Obviously, I'm sure there are. But the sooner we acknowledge... This fact that the sooner we get past ourselves and on the bandwagon to spiritual maturity, if we're not already well on the way. So the clock is ticking. Last paragraph, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is trying at times. I know. It may be repetitious. That's true. That's how instinct is developed. In the military, you have drill and ceremony where you learn how to march and how to do under command as a group things as simple as marching, as simple as doing parade rest, as simple as checking someone's ID in a field exercise, as simple as doing the order of the day, as simple as knowing the chain of command all the way through to the president from your, from your squad leader to your platoon sergeant to your platoon leader all the way through the battalion through the brigade through the post through the secretary of the in our case the secretary of the army then uh, the secretary of the department of of justice i mean the department of defense all the way up through the commander in chief all that stuff can be asked and they will ask you that stuff in the service developing instinct requires repetition and thinking pedagogy as you want to call it but that's what it takes to develop those instincts. And then in the combat that you and I get ourselves involved in with dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil, when it's instinctive for you and I to do the right thing, it honors the Lord. And it also is tallied up as part of your reward package. If you grow weary and growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, then you will not grow at all. Just as God perseveres with patience and long suffering on our behalf so must we persevere in his will for our lives because there are times when it's not easy being what he wants us to be or doing what he wants us to do it may be novel a novelty for us a while but after that it becomes a way of life so we must process the truth from an academic Learned perspective, Second Peter 3.18, till it becomes spiritual knowledge in our human spirit. We meditate on it. We allow it to be understood where before it becomes a spiritual knowledge, a higher knowledge, and an understanding of God's will. 
Without understanding, there is misunderstanding. And with misunderstanding comes unexpected uh, consequences. With misunderstanding uh, comes uh, unfulfilled expectations. There are a lot of believers who may have great expectations when they get when they as they're maturing as they're getting older in life anyway but they may not be ready for the beam of seat of christ and one of the first things that i said almost 19 years ago 19 years ago as the pastor here is that my job is to help prepare you for that day because the rest of eternity or whatever days it takes the rest of eternity you will live the results of the rewards not a, a nod on the head, but rewards. And that may not mean a lot to you now, and I'm not saying that it does, but it will mean a lot to all of us when that time comes. It would be better for you to have someone who is not mean. That's not right. I would get rolled over by the Lord, but on point and more factual than sentimental or, or, or showy or whatever. It would be more that I would Get you prepared. I'm getting helping you, not that you're not helping yourself. But my job is to help prepare you to go to battle. My job is to help you to, to deal with yourself and to deal with your spouse and your friends in a, a godly way. My job is to do that by teaching the word. And, and in essence, preparing you as I'm being prepared the same way to stand before the Lord someday. That is as real to me as this Bible is or this wooden pew is in front of me. It's not like Ah, we'll see. It's it's kind of, you know, I'm, ignorant people don't know how to explain uh, the things of heaven uh, because they don't study scripture. We can know what to expect pretty much. It should not be a shock to us what the procedures are going to be like. Now, there'll be some things, obviously, that we don't aren't privy to, obviously. And it may be that we don't go all the way into the third heaven and we're judged at the beam of seat of Christ and given our white robes before we get to the Father's throne because we're still having our works judged for reward. And the Lord would like to present us in our shining glory. So we'll see how that goes. Some of you might get left on Pluto or somewhere. No, I'm just teasing. I might get left on Mars anyway. But we must stay in fellowship with the Lord, and by so doing, the Holy Spirit can lead us. When we are tested, we then are in a spiritual condition to apply truth that we stored in our hearts. And we're going to be tested. And most of the testing that gets us in trouble is the subtle type of testing. Not the blatant, you know, he slammed the door in my face. She called me a name. You know, somebody dropped, going down the highway, walk, drive, drive, walking through the store there. You see them drop money and you take it. Instead of call, hey, hey, you dropped this here. You know, you test it. Little things, that they pop up. The pretty guy, the pretty girl, they pop up. I don't know, pretty, you're not supposed to say that about men, I guess, but you know what I'm saying. Being ready. Every day is how we're, we're supposed to live. You and I do not scale the cliffs of spiritual maturity in a single bound in giant leaps like Superman or Superwoman. We pick our way up the cliff inch by inch as we learn the Word of God, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We're not getting closer to God. We're getting closer to looking like the Son of God. That's... We're not going to get any more loved by God. We're not going to get any more righteous. Being mature doesn't make you more righteous. That is a position that Christ does alone. But maturity is a climbing that, that mountain, as it were, uh, step by step, inch by inch, uh, picking the way and listening, watching out, fighting your self-doubt, and keep going forward knowing that you're going to the right place. We must trust Him for our footing. We must trust Him for our grip. Our position is safe, so we're, we've got a, a tether on us. We're not going to crash and explode at the bottom of the cliff. But our practice takes due diligence 
in getting and maintaining our maturity as Christians because once you get to the level of Christianity that we call spiritual maturity, there's another status that follows that, and it's called greater grace status. Greater grace status is actually where you want to get to in the Christian life because in that place, you are in the secret place of God. Now, it's not something spooky. It's just simply that you will not be denied the truth come you know what or high water. You have a sense about yourself that you know what you're, you're about, what God is about, the silly, foolish little things that go on around you, even in Christianity. Uh, they are like something that you would see in a kindergarten in spiritual, in, in a spiritual perspective. They are like something that you would, you don't denounce it because you don't get Mature until you've learned to stumble and fall and as a toddler Christian and that as a, a youthful Christian, then as an adolescent Christian, then that as a young adult Christian. I'm talking about that from a spiritual realm, not your physical age. These things take stages, but it's intended that you're maturing all of your life. But in greater grace status, you have what is known as a friend of God mindset. God trusts you. You're not going to jump ship. You're not going to uh, uh, make a disgrace of Christ, and uh, you're dependable. And um, there are some other things because there are some things that you may go through that are going to be misunderstood. And as as Job went through, as Paul went through, and other greats, men and women have gone through, uh, where uh, you will probably only be understood by God Himself. Those things are happening. But yet at the same time, you have to live in the world with everybody else. You still have to walk through the kindergarten at times. <laughs> and you don't fit in the chair no more. You don't fit in that desk anymore. <laughs> and you're cheering people on. New Christians, you're excited about Christ. Uh, you're settled. You take time to pray and think. And... um it's a wonderful life. And not that stupid baby where uh, Jimmy Stewart is yelling at the end. I cannot stand that thing. Arr, arr, I never could stand that hollering. I said, shut that thing off, please. It sounded like a siren going off. But you know what I'm saying. In the Christian life, uh, teach his own. Um, you also learn to have a sense of humor about yourself. You may become a little bit facetious at times. But you realize don't push it. <laughs> Paul was certainly that way. He was very facetious at times. He would say, say things in a way that would get the point across that um, that only he could probably get away with. I, I don't know that I would get away with it. But anyway, um, there is a lot that we have as we get prepared for that time. And as I said, if the Lord should rapture us out tonight, which he very well could do, uh, maybe we're a little bit more prepared than we were an hour ago uh, for that time. Anyway, we'll build on this as well. Thank you, Father, for this day and for your grace, for your kindness to us. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you now for uh, those who have come out on this uh, winter night uh, to study a portion of your word, to encourage, uh, to be encouraged in the word, hopefully, and to encourage one another in fellowship. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus. Thank you that he did for us what we could never have done for ourselves, and continues to do for us what your spirit continues to do for us, what your word and your plan continues to provide for us. We are so thankful for that. And we ask now that you would just give us the strength, the wisdom to live out the life that you'd have us to live. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.